I seem to talk about this a lot. In this video, I'll put the spotlight specifically on the scleral lens. Hey everybody, my name is Dr. Natalie Chai. This channel brings you the latest science-based education and treatments in dry eye disease, myopia management, and specialty contact lenses to help you understand why it should matter to you for optimal eye health function, comfort, and even beauty. The scleral lens is probably my most favorite specialty contact lens and will always consider this option first for a patient before any other designs. It is just so versatile in providing great vision and also great comfort when fitted correctly and oftentimes has been the tipping point for gaining back independence in someone's life. Let's see why a scleral lens is so special for a lot of practitioners. Let's first define what a scleral lens is. The scleral lens is a large diameter, rigid gas permeable contact lens that rests on the white part of the eye, which is the sclera, entirely vaulting over the cornea and trapping a layer of fluid between the back of the lens and the front of the cornea. Now I won't go into the history of the scleral lens. In fact, I'll point you over to one of my earlier videos where I do discuss the history of the contact lens, including the scleral lens here. Number two, the scleral lens usage. Currently, scleral lenses are used in patients who have irregular corneas. This includes eye diseases such as keratoconus, pellucid marginal degeneration, or when a cornea is left irregular secondary to things like refractive surgery or after a corneal transplant. It can also be used in ocular surface diseases, as in the case of after an infection, where it can leave a scar tissue causing irregularities on the cornea. I've also mentioned before that scleral lenses are excellent in dry eye disease where other management options might not achieve the desired comfort in dry eye. The scleral lens is also used in patients who have high refractive errors. So for those who have extremely high uh, prescriptions in myopia, hyperopia, or even a considerable amount of astigmatism. Number three, the fitting and optical characteristics of a scleral lens. The number one most obvious difference a scleral lens has over other contact lens is the size when compared to a corneal rigid gas permeable lens. The landing point of the scleral lens, as I've mentioned numerous times before, is that it rests on the white part of the eye. Patients who have irregular corneas or compromised corneas do not have to worry about a lens directly contacting the fragile tissue, further damaging it. The comfort is surprisingly pleasant and most time better than a corneal gas permeable lens. It may not seem so due to its size. However, the sclera is less densely innervated than the corneal tissue. So let's go into number four. How is a scleral lens fit? Now using a diagnostic fitting sets are still essential when fitting a scleral lens. One may think that we are able to independently design the scleral lens off of a corneal topographer. However, there was a study done at the Mayo Clinic where they found that topography is actually not very useful when fitting scleral lenses. Now if you think about it, the scleral lens vaults over the cornea, so knowing its shape is really not particularly good information. However, I do still take the corneal topographies as it does gives me good insight to how steep a patient's cornea is so I can choose the initial diagnostic lens more accurately. From the topography, I can also measure what is known as the horizontal visible iris diameter or the HVID or the corneal diameter. This helps me determine the overall diameter and size of the scleral lens. Now the average HVID is anywhere between 11.6 millimeters to 12 millimeters. So knowing this information is especially important. When we insert the scleral lens on a patient's eye, there are generally three criteria that needs to be met. The first, there has to be complete corneal and limbal vault or clearance. Centrally, we are looking for something called the apical clearance, where there is just the right amount of liquid reservoir between the cornea and the back surface of the lens. Now under the microscope, we look at the quality of the fluorescein dye to determine if the depth is too shallow, too deep, or just right. As in this example, sometimes a shallow lens can actually touch the cornea. Sometimes we can faintly see the iris and pupil in a darkened fluorescein pattern, and that may signify actually a too shallow lens as well. We're looking for 
for a bright fluorescein pattern that almost floods the entire cornea. Also with the slit lamp, we use a technique called the optic section, where we are also able to measure the thickness of the tear film. We can see the distinct layers of the lens itself, the tear film, and then the cornea. We know the standard thickness of the scleral lens, which is usually given by the manufacturer. In this example, let's say the thickness of the lens is 300 micron. Usually, we want the thickness of the tear film to match the thickness of the scleral lens. We can do that because the tear film is highlighted green by the yellow dye. Second, looking past the center part of the scleral lens, we want the lens to completely vault over the limbus and land with all of its weight on the sclera. If you remember, the limbus is the transitional zone between the cornea and conjunctiva, which is the clear covering over the sclera. To observe clearance in this area, we use white light to see how far out does the yellow dye bleed out past the limbus and out onto the sclera. However, we do not want to see the yellow dye near the edge of the lens. Thirdly, we want to make sure that the weight distribution of the lens is equal 360 degrees on the sclera. We are looking for excessive edge lift, tightening or even blanching of the conjunctival vessels. Now based on the initial observations of the fit, we would either remove the lens and fit the next diagnostic lens or adjust accordingly to improve the fit. Once we have the best fitting diagnostic lens on the eye, the patient can usually already see an improvement in their vision. This is because the liquid reservoir acts to optically mimic a smoother cornea and a smoother corneal curvature, which bends light again, more similar to a normal cornea. Now we still need to perform an over refraction with the foropter to determine the best lens power for best vision. Now a lens fitting can be quite time consuming, constantly putting on a lens, observing, then removing, then inserting another lens, then observing, etc. However, there is a lot of new technology out there that aims to more accurately map out the sclera, just as in the example of this SMAP 3D computer, and there are others that take a custom impression-based technology, such as with the iPrint Pro or the EPP. And then the impression is sent out to a lab with 3D printing technology. So it is highly customized lens that matches every detail of the patient's ocular surface. And this is also going on my wish list as well. Once we are confident we have all the necessary parameters, we go ahead and place the order with the lab for manufacturing. When the lens arrives, we have the patient return for the dispense and training. Now to evaluate the fit accurately, once the lens is on the eye, I actually allow it to settle on the eyeball for at least 30 minutes before evaluating it under the slit lamp microscope again. I also use the OCT or the optical coherence tomography to obtain a cross-sectional view of the scleral lens to further evaluate the detail of where the scleral lens land and also the amount of clearance centrally. The cool thing is the OCT, we use this regularly in routine eye exams for taking uh, photos of the optic nerve for glaucoma and also taking a closer look at the tissues in say macular degeneration. This enhances how we visualize the lens on the eye and can guide us further to tweak certain aspects of the lens for the best possible fit. The crazy thing is that with all the high technology, it allows us to obtain a higher percentage of first fit success. After, we will then coach and train the patient on insertion and removal, as well as the correct lens hygiene protocol. I'll have another video on the different methods of inserting and removal. So there you have it. Hopefully you learned something about how optometrists go about fitting a scleral lens for our patients. Now stay tuned for more videos around this as information and technology is continually changing. If you enjoy learning more around topics like this, please subscribe to my channel and click on the notification bell to make sure you don't miss any of my new videos every Thursday. Take care of your eyes and we'll see you in the next video next week.